I am Eve. I'm the symposium director at Pop Montreal. I am so happy to be introducing this amazing panel. Are musicians supposed to struggle to be successful in their careers? I think we know what the implied answer is, but I'm really excited to talk about it. This is an amazing panel of people. I don't want to take up any more time. I want to let them get into it. Please join me in welcoming Ari Swan, the moderator, who will introduce everyone else. Hello. Um, thank you all for being here and for everyone that's online. So, like Eve said already, this is Are Musicians Supposed to Struggle to Break Even or When Can We Smash Capitalism? Oh, you know. Spoiler alert, that's probably what we're going to talk about. Um, so, I mean, it's true that theoretically we know, like, the implied answer to that is no. But I think there's also a lot of people, and probably we've all met people who are like, well, I don't know, maybe, like, isn't that sort of what artists do because they chose art, like isn't the best music, doesn't that come out of struggle and like, you know, we're sort of trying to break down those myths and figure out like why do those myths even exist, who are they serving, you know, what can we do to sort of rewrite that narrative um, because the reality is that really the struggle actually makes art unsustainable and that a lot of people aren't really struggling uh, because in music, like in every other field, there's a huge you know, divide in terms of economic resources and that kind of thing, but like, why do we pretend that everybody is struggling? And again, what does that do? And why do we punish musicians that complain? I'm looking at Carly, who will definitely be talking to us about their experience with uh, sort of a backlash to talking about the realities of touring. So I will give a little introduction to myself and all of the panelists. Um, so I'm Ari Swan, I'm a violinist, composer, sometimes pianist, sometimes singer, sometimes fundraiser, uh, and uh, I've been doing Pop Montreal panels for a while. I'm really excited to be part of this. Okay, we're gonna go left and all the way down. So hello, this is Jess. Uh, Jess Skolnick is an activist, musician, and writer who lives primarily in Chicago, but they were raised around the DC area by, as you describe it, two hippie parents and the local punk scene, which sounds incredible. Uh, just as an advocate for the working class, LGBTQ plus movements, sexual assault survivors, and is against, working against state violence and prisons. So, fuck yes. Um, you have, they have written for zines, broadcast, broadsheets, alt weeklies, and you are currently the senior editor of Bandcap Daily, if I'm correct. Amazing. Um, if, if I forget any cool things in your folks' bios, do tell me. <laughs> you know, it's almost like a whole thing trying to make sure you get everybody's stuff in. Um, so, Joey La Neve Di Francesco, who is a Rhode Island based musician, organizer, and historian. Uh, he performs in the drag dance act La Neve and has been a longtime songwriter and guitarist with the punk band Downtown Boys. And Joey has also long worked as a labor organizer and is the co founder of the organization The Union for Musicians and Allied Workers, which we are hopeful that is something that can also happen in Montreal. Um, Continuing moving to the left, so Kim uh, Register, you are who is a queer socialist, non-binary musician with the musician with the group Lomelands, if I'm correct, That's right, yeah. and a venue owner and operator in Durham, North Carolina, uh, and you work very hard to create safer spaces. And um, I don't your bio is it is very short compared to everyone else's. Do you have anything else that you want to add? I think those are the talking points right there. Wonderful. Yeah. The venue is called the Pinhook, just so you know. Um, we have another North Carolina person. We've got real good North Carolina representation. Carly Hartsman, singer, songwriter, and front person for the Asheville-based band Wednesday. Their most recent album, Twin Plagues, was released on Orendel Records in 2021 uh, to lots of great praise. Um, and they'll be telling us a lot about their experience touring. So I kind of want to start from what feels a little bit like, a bit like the beginning, but at least it was a bit for me. So when did you, do, is there a moment or is there sort of a storied moment when you started to realize that not everybody was working with the same sort of resources in terms of being in the music scene? I will very quickly say kind of like my realization was kind of this belief that everybody else or a lot of other people were just like much better at music than I was. Like they, you know, managed to like live alone while also being like full-time touring musicians and like, you know, getting record contracts and doing all these things and making it very big and then sort of later sort of recognizing like, oh, you're working with very different resources than I have, but like none of us talk about it. So I didn't, I didn't even think about that because this is the music field and we're all supposed to just be musicians and it's supposed to be equitable somehow. So was there a moment when you started to realize that that kind of inequity was really seeping into the music scene? 
I would say that my uh, formative moment actually came in my teen years. Um, it was a very long time ago. <laughs> um, so this is like the early to mid 90s. Um, and uh, growing up in the DC area, um, there's a lot of money that nobody ever talks about. Um, I remember like getting made fun of on my way to a show at the Wilson Center um, by like a bunch of like cool Georgetown punk kids. Um, who all had like the correct clothes and the correct hair and like many more patches and whatnot than I had and I was just wearing like clothes because I like wasn't cool enough or rich enough to be able to afford like anything that might look, you know, like I belonged at the punk show or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that, I think that was, like, really my, like, first moment where I was, like, oh, yeah, all of you, like, go to private schools. Right, okay. And all of you are the ones whose parents bought you, like, a whole bunch of new uh, equipment so that you could form bands. And you have, like, the garage space to practice in and whatnot. Um, like, I was lucky because my parents ran... Uh, my. My parents are uh, both musicians, and my dad ran an amp repair shop out of our basement when I was a little kid, and so like fixed up instruments were like how I learned to do things, and I was just lucky that I had parents that were also involved, but like otherwise we wouldn't have been able to afford any of that stuff, and so that, I think, a real formative moment for me. Yeah, I think there's like many moments of kind of realizations of how the industry works and operates exactly. I think growing up, um, like nobody I knew and my family around me played music. It seemed like a very sort of like unattainable, um, uh, like weird thing. It just like wasn't something anyone did. You know, I saw musicians and didn't know like where these people came from or anything like that. It wasn't until much later until we got into it. But you know, um, I'm from Providence and band camp in Providence and. Uh, when you're like working for many, many, many years to get to like even a place of like almost breaking even, and then you see bands that just like come out of nowhere um, and already have all of these industry connections um, because they have that wealth and status and connection via a private school or via a parent um, who is operating in the industry or the child of a celebrity or like wherever that cultural or like literal capital is coming from, they immediately had access to it that like, you know, my group didn't. Um, and then, you know, it continued to develop because then, you know, the group kind of got to a point where we're maybe playing some of these festivals, like interacting with these record labels, getting some of those markers of what you think of as being some kind of sustainability or status in the industry, and it's still nothing. It's still like, okay, you can, this is like sort of a part-time job um, economically, and you still all have to be working full-time. Um, and it's like, where are any of these people getting money? And then you kind of look further, and it's still like, even the people we think of as doing well, you know, you see these stories like every two weeks, like most recently last week, where you're like Santa Gold like put out a statement saying that she couldn't um, afford to be touring anymore. And this is like pretty common now that we see even people who are getting to this point where you're like, okay, you have this more privileged position in the industry, you're not making any money. So for me, I'm always at the point where it's okay, there, there is this class discrepancy within music workers ourselves, of course, but the big one one is who's making money. It's the tech CEOs. It's the the um, CEOs of these like three big major companies. The higher ups at Spotify, Apple Music, etc., are kind of like so much even higher than like even the you know whatever kid who went to private school who I still like have some anger toward because they had like quicker access to this. But anyway, I feel like there's a lot of layers more than like this particular moment. Yeah, I think. Um I'm con like you were saying, I think I'm constantly realizing that I don't know like where money is coming from or where it's going, even in like my music career or even as a venue owner. Like I'm like, oh, like just don't understand the situation. And that's because we don't talk about money as a society or as people, period. And I think that that is the, like even amongst our peers. Um, and I think th that is such a capitalist tactic, right? Is to like divide and separate and silence. And I think it's really, I mean, it's obviously really working. And um, anyway, I know we'll get back into like how to solve the problem. But um, I think my thing was in music, like in music and in the industry, it's like not cool also to have a lot of money. Like there's that whole aspect. So there's like, I remember being really young and being like Nirvana and grunge and all the things. And I was like, oh yeah, holes and pants and like 
like that was a style and not a necessity. And I think I realized when I, one of my favorite bands was the Butchies and Durham. They're so fucking good. And they were this, to me, they were huge. I was like, they're selling out 800 cat venues. They're fucking huge. Um, and then after their third release, the person, Kaya Wilson, started working at Trader Joe's. And I was like heartbroken in my like idealistic, like, you know, 14 year old self. Cause I was like, she's giving up her career. And it's like, she's actually just subsidizing it because musicians don't and have never gotten paid enough to make a living to subsidize their life. So I think that was a big moment for me. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to forgive me. It's my first time talking at one of these things, so I'm a little nervous. But um, yeah, I think I was kind of lucky in a way because I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. There wasn't people with industry connections there. Um, everyone was playing pop punk music, and the first band that would like let me in uh, was a pop punk band and it took me like several years to realize that wasn't what I wanted to even play and then I <laughs> went from there um, but really the divide was more like in that space was like either you had lessons or you didn't like that was the biggest divide financially and in my case I was I taught myself how to play in college um, at UNCA because the community there was like really accepting and there's a big DIY space so even then I was still around people that were like not, yeah, like making their way up slowly or whatever. So I didn't have a huge um, exposure to like whatever you want to call it, like industry plant, talk, talking about that kind of stuff until I was connected with like the larger music community um, online. And I was realizing like, and I'm really thankful we came up this way slowly, but it took us five years and three albums to like quit our jobs and be able to tour full time. Whereas like, yeah, there was bands I was seeing online that were, I didn't know how it was happening, but their music was, they were fine immediately. Um, and I guess, yeah, luck has so much more to do with it than you think too. Cause like, yeah, like my first piece of gear was like gifted to me by this guy that came in to the coffee shop I worked and like it went from there. So it's like unfair how like, how much chance factors into it for people that yeah, like can't buy their way in, I guess. Yeah, I feel like that's such, that's such a true point is it's, chance is a really big thing. There's tons of people who are really, really talented who won't have any chance, like, you know, regardless I guess of access to resources to some degree, but Definitely something just that you said around sort of like realizing like the type of gear that these folks were going to private school had access to and that kind of thing. That was a really, that was sort of a turning point for me as well because like, because I play violin and because I'm like classically trained, I'm very much like acoustic instrument, like I know how to play instrument and sometimes some pedals and that's pretty much it. But then there was, you know, there's a big shift to everyone sort of doing everything on laptops and having access to all this electronic equipment. And that was really kind of what stopped me from being able to do that because I was like, I can't actually afford this because I was old enough that like, I was on my own and I was paying my own rent and doing this stuff and it's like, I can't buy a new laptop. I can't buy any of like the plugins that go with this. I actually can't do any of these things. Uh, and that was, and seeing it, like a lot of other people have access to this was like, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. I think I see something, so yeah. But so I wonder then like what you folks think about the, like like your point Kim about like, we don't talk about money and that that is so true. That's, that's a big part of this because it isn't cool to have money and be a musician. Like, you know, everyone's supposed to sort of be pretending to like slum it or whatever, but like a lot of people aren't. So like. Why is that? Outside of like, it's definitely the greater capitalism sort of crap, but like more on our like local level, what is like fueling this myth that we all need to have that it, like we're all coming from the same resources and we just haven't bootstrapped ourselves up enough? I feel like that's kind of what I was, I've been like trying to understand, like, cause yeah, like you kind of brought it up earlier, but the kind of the reason I'm here is cause I like, made this tweet about <laughs> tour finances and like wasn't like was just literally posting the information was not even saying like it's like nothing I was like I'm gonna post this in the like least inflammatory way I could possibly imagine like I'm just gonna put the numbers on there and then yeah the the reaction was so emotional and I've yeah I'm like been desperately trying to understand like where is that coming from for people and the first kind of hint 
I realized as I was watching Decline of Western Civilization for the first time, like a week ago, the first one is set in the like late 70s, I think, or that's when it was filmed. And I was like, okay, this is the kind of punk they want me to be. Like, they want me to be renting a $16 closet and be like, doing that if I'm gonna be like making punk adjacent music or whatever. And it's just like, other than that, I've been like having such a hard time understanding why like people even in other bands that tour were like criticizing talking about finances online. I've, I don't, yeah, I'm trying, if any of y'all have an answer, I'm really trying to understand. Yeah, I think that part of it, um, and a big part of it, would be um, the fact that uh, that we, art and labor are intertwined, but we don't want to necessarily um, talk about connecting them. Um, and that if you, uh, if you bring up finances, um, you have to actually talk about labor and fair wages and, and what all of that means. Um, we, there's this just giant myth that art is this you know mystical thing that comes out of the creative impulse and um, doesn't actually have any like material costs or functions um, and none of that of course is true. Um, there's also the fact that like and I say this as like a, as an old punk like uh, even the circumstances that were available to me like in the like early to mid 90s, even the late 90s, like just that those economic circumstances don't exist anymore. Um, survival is not on the same terms anymore um, because of where we are in in late stage capitalism. And, and you know, it's 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 hard enough to buy groceries. It's hard enough to pay rent. Um, those things were not as difficult to achieve mm. um, at that time um, because there were, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that that I will not like get into the weeds with, but. Yeah, I think it's a lot of like, also r romanticism of, of struggle, but by not, I mean, and, and I could be completely mistaken, but not by people who actually struggle also. Um, and the question why I don't, I can't, I know that it's like a fed, I mean, capitalism is a machine that extracts and does that by creating mythology. And so the only why I have is like, so that Apple can make a ton of money or so that anyone else can make a ton of money. But, and it doesn't only do it with, money, um, it does it with mental health, too. And a lot of artists don't get an adequate mental health care because it's supposed to be a way that art is created. And it's also a block for other people to create art, right? It's like people are, like some people feel, I know friends of mine who feel like too normal <laughs> to like make art, you know, like they aren't struggling enough. Um, and that is just something that isn't ours. And I think that, I know we'll get into like, sort of like, what can we do? But it's like talking about money and a lot of the punk scene and a lot of other scenes are talking about mental health at this point. But, and, and I'm this person that's always wanting to talk about money. And as somebody who always wants to talk about money, um, because I handle the venue side of things a lot too, um, I, it's uncomfortable for everybody else. And so, I don't know, my only answer is I talk about it. I'm like, hey, do we have consent so that I can talk about finances right now? How much money do you make? <laughs> you know, it's super awkward, but that's it. Yeah, I think, I think it's coming from a couple places. Um, as you're saying, there's the mythology of it, and I think the struggle in popular music is sort of baked into the product that the music industry is creating from the beginning of there being a popular music industry. So many of the songs, so much of the music is coming out of actual struggle, right? It's coming out of black blues music, songs that are about struggle, and the product is very much packaged in being this, uh, you know, thing of struggle or working class rebellion. Um, 
and the industry has always like profited from that from its very beginning and sort of like wants to continually recreate a product that has this stamp of like struggle and so, like working class identities, certain racial identities onto it. I think that's an aspect for it. And then I think that um, like mystification of what succeeds and what does not succeed and of like where the money's coming from also is sort of necessary to the functioning of the industry of this idea that, okay, the most streamed thing on Spotify is the most streamed thing because that artist is the best artist, they're the most talented, making the best thing, end of the story. There's no, you know, th three big music companies that run everything. There's no, like, one radio company, Clear Channel, that you know, owns the, the majority of the music uh, radio stations in the country. There's no one with their finger on it. It's just the market is working perfectly. Um, and this is, you know, just what's rising to the top is what's rising to the top. And this is, you know, more broadly in capitalism, how we, we think of things, it's the, the, the myth that soul is just whatever succeeds, it happens for a reason, there's nothing behind it, there's no class relations behind it, there's no class conflict behind it, it just happens. Um, and I think that's particularly exaggerated in the music industry, um, like we're saying, and so if we're struggling in the music industry, it's because we're just not good enough, we're just not hustling enough, um, it has nothing to do with any of this other, you know, class relations monopolies going on behind the scenes. It's our fault. Um, and I think you, you could more broadly see that economically with like most workers and like a capitalist economy, but uh, yeah, we see it really pronounced um, in the music industry. This reminds me of what Jess and I were talking about backstage, which is that economics is astrology for white dudes. Prove me wrong. Anyway, <laughs> just like, I'm sorry, that is always just a bunch of theory that cannot be proven. And I say this as someone who likes talking about astrology, but it, and every time that it is not proven, it's like, wait, 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 there is something we are missing. You just did it wrong. So just spreading that along. Um, yeah, so like, Kim, to your point about like wanting to talk about money, and I, I, often also want to do that too because I think it's really important that workers like talk about how much money you're making and things like I think I've worked at a lot of jobs where like you know salaries are relatively obscured and there's just like a lot of you know you don't know what all of your other colleagues are making and it just leads itself into allowing people to be paid less depending on like where they fall in the social strata so I'm very into the idea of just telling everyone how much money I make what things cost oh, so yeah. that's super important but have you found generally that that have you gotten backlash about that? If any of you have sort of had to try, you know, tried to have these conversations with folks, have you found that there's more receptiveness maybe to talking about this kind of thing? I mean, it's terrible. It's terrifying. <laughs> like, but it's, but it's one of those things that somebody who deals with money, I'm like, I need to like go through that. Like that's my sort of thing that I have to do. I have to be like introduced to this uncomfortable topic. But yeah, I mean, I feel like I've tried to talk to a lot of people, including venues, about like, how much money are you paying this artist? Because we're like a bootstraps, I mean, we're not bootstraps, I hate that word anyway. We're like a pretty zero profit <laughs> business. Um, and so I'm like, I wanna pay artists, but am I just, I don't know this agent. Like, are they just trying to get, do they think we're this like flush club or whatever? But even people like other venues don't wanna talk about offers or contracts or whatever. I mean, I think the next panel that I would like to see is like, yo, like it's like a roast or something. It's like, but it doesn't have to be that roasty, but it's just like, hey, just be honest. How much money are you making? And people just have to like push through that fear of like talking about it because nothing is going to happen to you if you say it, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's also just from the flip side, there's a lot of judgment of people who do have finances or access, and I think that's another thing. It's like, people are afraid to talk, artists that I know that have made it, whatever that means, that have resources that they're trying to offer to communities are like afraid that they aren't gonna do it right, you know? Because if they offer resources that admits they have resources, and then they aren't offering them to the right people, and, I, and it's like, it should just be like a conversation because you are gonna fuck it up, you know? Um, but I think there's a lot of conversation that we all need to have about how we interact with money and people with money um, to make it feel like a, this is a circle I'm making, I don't know the word, but to feel like this, you know? I was gonna say, um, like kind of 
I was thinking of this during the last question too, but a lot of the responses I got and like have gotten are like, why is this person obsessed with money? Like, why is this person? And it's just like, no one, it's like no one that has money is gonna need to talk about this. Why would I be like obsessed with getting money if I'm like saying something about the fact, like I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about it. I felt like I had to because I didn't know what else to like, it's like I just feel like people don't know this information and I have the experience. And yeah, I think that's like a lot of the like confusion that's happening that like talking about money equals like being obsessed with making money or like equals it being your top priority in music. Like I just want to continue doing music and I need that to, like I need to make money to do it, you know? And my bandmates, I have a five piece band and we're dividing all that stuff up. So it's like, if, if, like, if I don't bring it up, it's not gonna happen for us because otherwise, you know, we'll just sink into the background and work at Trader Joe's, you know, and I don't want to do that, so. Yeah, yeah the, the level of secrecy is really striking, and you talk to other bands, and it's like, yeah, you're, like, talking about some deep, dark secret or something, and, you know, this is in a lot of industries, like, a lot of employers, corporations try to get you to sign contracts, and you're first starting there, I don't know if it's true here, too, in the States, you see it a lot, that, like, you know, it's like we ask you not to discuss your salary like with your coworkers and it's a big, you know, kind of like union busting tactic to do this. And, you know, that carries over into the music industry too, where um, yeah, you talk to other bands and we'll like, you know, to like talk to bands that kind of like equal status us and find out, yeah, the like I don't know, like all like white band with mostly the same like stats as us and everything you could measure is getting paid like three times as much to play the same festival. And it's like, why is that happening? Like there's, the, um, but it's so secretive and you like really have to ask people to do that. I mean, with, with Yuma organization, one of the things we're trying to do is make those kinds of like inventories of, um, you know, within cities, how much clubs are playing. Because if you're booking your own shows, you don't have access to this information. Booking, if you have a booking agent, booking agent has like tons of data on how much like every band has been paid at whatever venue, they keep logs of this stuff. But if you're booking your own shows, you don't have access to that, you have no idea what to ask for, and it's so secretive. Um, and then when you do ask for, you know, I'm like, um, my newer project, I'm still I'm, I'm booking it myself, but it's like if I get a request for a show, right back and say, hey, what's the financial deal gonna be? And it's like I still feel like a pang of like, oh, they're gonna just like stop responding to my emails now, and they'll write back something like, oh, we'll give you, you know, like 40% of the door after the the room fee, and then I have to write back and be like, okay, what's the room fee? And <laughs> it's like five emails going through, like begging, just like tell me what the thing is. Um, but we all still have to do that because it's still so secretive. So I think it's it's really like musicians need to get together. And I know like I've seen like spreadsheets of like journalists doing this of like how much um, you know freelance journalists are getting paid for like how many word count at different publications. Like these sorts of things exist. Um, but uh, yeah, largely musicians have not like just talked to each other about have not been organized with it. There's even like there's a lot of resist resistance even in writer world for that too. Like. When, when who's pay, who pays writers, which is like the tool you're talking about, like when that when that like went up, there was just like a whole lot of like weird resistance about that too, because they're the same class problems exist um, in writing for sure. And I find too that like the craziest thing um, is when that secrecy even enters like the band as a unit, and like people aren't even talking about like how money gets split up and who's making this and who's making that, you know. Um, like, I have talked to other bands where, like, they've never had a conversation about that stuff. They've never, like, people don't know how, this is how much we got paid for that show, and this is how much it's getting split up, and, like, one person is, you know, handling all of the money, and there's never even any, like, democratic discussion about it. But that's, like, the level to which, like, that secrecy has, like, permeated, is that you can't even talk about it with the people that you're, like, literally doing the thing with, which is crazy. <laughs> it's oh yeah. I mean, I feel like it. It speaks a little bit to like obviously like the fear that we've touched on of being like like I also do that when I have to email someone about like how much is this gig gonna be or whatever. I like I don't know. I feel like I'm like oh I'm like not being an authentic artist by caring about how much you're going to pay me for my time even though I like 
fundamentally believe all of these things I am saying is still really ingrained in me to be like, but it's art and I need to just like, it's fine, we'll all just sort it out. And then I also feel like there's a little bit of that like, you know, if I write back to a venue or write back to a festival, I'm like, how much does this be? There's like a fear that they're just gonna be like, oh, you know what, actually never mind. Like the same as with like jobs or something, or like if I ask about salary expectations, it's like, oh, you know, never, never mind, we're not actually going to pay you, how dare you ask that? And it's like that weird, also sort of like capitalism trap of just like the tiniest little crumbs that we get. We're like, oh no, hoard them, hoard them, because if I tell you I have them, or if I mention that like I maybe need more crumbs, you're just gonna take the crumbs I have. So let me just be happy with the tiny crumbs I have now. So yeah, it is really difficult to start those conversations, but I mean, very important. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the resource movement at all, or if other people are. I don't know if it's still like going. I don't know much about it because I don't technically have enough resources to be part of the resource movement, but what it, what it really was was like trying to get people who are like second generation wealth basically to like talk about what their wealth is and like where did their wealth come from and sort of like, like it's, a, I'm sure it's a flawed movement. I don't know enough about it to be endorsing it, but it's more that I'm sort of like mentioning that there is sort of discussion outside of the music industry and broadly to sort of get people to have those really hard conversations. Um, but, you know, not an endorsement, don't know enough about it. <laughs> I think that's what's really cool. I think that's what's really cool about festivals like this or like where people are brought together that do the thing that hopefully we'll talk later or whatever is like, like getting relationships, like making relationships with people so you can talk about money. It's like, I'm also not going to go up to someone and be like, yo, how's your sex life? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or whatever, which is not quite the same thing, but it's like, it's hard to to broach a topic without having a relationship. So it's like, it is about building community and building trust so you can talk about things like that. I think that's, I just wanted to point that out. So thanks, Pop, it's a badass festival. Um, yeah, I feel like this sort of like transitions us into the phase of talking about like, okay, what can we do to make this a little bit better? I'm interested to know if there's, uh, in terms of like economic resources, for artists, are any of you kind of within your various musical communities? Are there community resources? Are there sort of like like obviously there is a union that you have part of you know part of starting, so that's a big one. But broadly, are there also other resources that people have like worked with or started that sort of like are helping artists who are, you know, sort of fighting against this or just having a trouble surviving within this? Um, a thing that I really love is instrument libraries. Um, there are synth libraries, there are uh, community pools of, of people with extra gear. Um, my, two of my bandmates uh, work for Reverb, so um, they're always talking about, uh, about like, you know, about that turnover and uh, like working to resource libraries like that. Um, that's, a, that's a really great love line uh, that I love very much. Um, and skill sharing within your own community too, um, doing uh, doing workshops and showing up um, and talking about you know like doing a, a how to silk screen workshop or a how to book a tour or how to put together a compilation or how like you know the basics of the basics of literally anything that you could like learn how to do for yourself in the music business or learn a world that you could learn how to navigate. Um, I think both of those are, are incredibly crucial um, things and things that I have been a part of. Yeah, definitely. Those are all uh, really very important. Um, you know, there's like community art spaces, there's also things like this. There's always to take whatever resources we have and sort of like better um, distribute them. I think this was, as you're kind of talking about at the beginning of the 90s and in the early part of the 2000s, this was sort of like more sustainable because there was not as much like broader wealth inequality in our country and more just like uh, ability to like afford rent, uh, purchase thing where people involved, um, there's less monopolization in the industry where you know there, everyone wasn't just listening to like five bands quite to the same extent they are now. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons. So I think, you know, it's about doing the twin thing of like supporting our, ourselves and our communities to the extent that we, that we can while also looking toward where is all this money? This is, the music industry is posting record profits every single year, even over COVID, right? Spotify tripled in valuation over COVID while we were all like wrecked, right? Um, there's the money there and 
you have to take it somehow. <laughs> the only way you take it is like get organized, which you can do out of these communities, out of meeting each other, of like, you know, out of organizing, right? Because it's the only way we're going to really achieve these things, like take money from them and to like increase state funding um, for this stuff. Because there's a lot of money flying around. We're just getting less and less of it every single year, just like in every other industry. To put like an extra fine point on that, I think it's a like the Spotify valuation is not actually what Spotify's profits are because they are taking in giant rounds of funding from venture capital and then venture capital wants that money back, which is like part of the rapacious growth of the music industry. And so I think that that's like an extra like step to like we got to talk about that too um, on top of everything. Yeah. It's also just all going to collapse. It's all like the financialization you see everywhere in the economy. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, so before, um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Yuma, just sort of like how that started and just, you know, anyone that's interested in starting their own chapter, anything else that, that uh, you want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, so Yuma, it's, uh, you know, musicians and allied workers started like in 2020, um, sort of just as COVID was starting, um, kind of began as an effort to get in the U.S., um, musicians and freelance workers of any kind um, eligible for the same kind of like unemployment benefits because they you know we had this uh, for what was like one of the first times in this history kind of like a robust unemployment uh, program that a lot of musicians were able to take care of um, I mean it was a lot of labor organizations pushing for this we were like one small part of this but a lot of freelancers organizations were, were pushing for this and this sort of succeeded. Um, and it was part of an organization that had done, or a group of people who had done things like, you know, take on South by Southwest and, and some other, um, you know, things that passed and wanted to make a more kind of like concrete organization to keep building power in the music industry. Um, it's since expanded to take on, you know, Spotify. It's currently the, the biggest sort of campaign against the streaming service. Um, in, in the world, we've gotten legislation sponsored in the U.S. Uh, with representing leadership to leave to kind of like change how um, streaming royalties operate. Um, we have people working on a number of issues. You know, it's still the enormous amount of work to do. It's still like a young organization, um, but it's you know one one of I think a, a number of efforts that I think now are realizing. Yeah, we can't just fight this music industry and take it on like as an individual level. We can't just like tweet about it. We can't just say, okay, I'm gonna do this thing or not do this thing at an individual basis. We need to like build collective power if we're going to take on this like financialized uh, to, uh, music industry. So um, anyway, UMA exists at unionmusicians.org where you can get in touch with us if you do want to get involved, make a chapter appear. We do have like local chapters as well. For instance, one in, the L in L Los Angeles has been actually focused on the project we were just talking about of like making a list of venues and how much they pay um, and sort of doing that kind of like local accountability for um, uh, how, how venues are, are treating the musicians who pay them. Um, so it's a very kind of like open project and just this idea of, yeah, we need to build collective power if we're really gonna get anything done. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, I, I'm a real like advocate to you of like, yeah, collective power, but also, and also like people with power, like direct distribution of power, like direct giving. So people who have money directly giving it to artists or directly giving it to organizations that they trust will give it to artists. Like without wealth distribution or redistribution, that's, that's very tangible. It's like trusting government to, to undo government is not gonna work. <laughs> so, so like making relationships, I mean, with people who have money or, I mean, there's so many, there's so many rich white men that's my, my thing is like, there's always a rich white man that'll help you out. Cause there's like, there is this like idea, the mythology of like exposure, right? That is payment for musicians and art artists all around. Um, and then there is also like, weirdly or not, like some kind of like thing that art, art is really valuable, right? And I think that that value sometimes to some people translates into wanting to fund it with money. Um, and it's an interesting thing that I don't really know how to navigate, but getting money from people with money, I think is a good idea. <laughs> and then to like distribute yourself or like my friend Kyle and I are talking about who runs Sleeping Village, um, doing like, we run venues. So doing like uh, 
panels on like with industry people who we trust and love and know. Like to be like, here's how you write a booking email or here's how you like just like sort of free school type things, you know, that because that information along with money information is like also tightly guarded, like access information. So I just really think it, it takes people with power and with platforms to offer them up to other people um, as well. Yeah, um, so uh, the one thing I'll say, I guess, uh, <laughs> um, my mind just went blank. Um, no, yeah, the one thing I kind of regretted about, um, basically the reason I'm here, this tweet that blew up, um, was that I was becoming a spokesperson for this thing that I didn't really know much about. Um, and that's why this panel is probably the only place. I got asked to do articles or whatever. I was like, I don't want to be that person for this because I don't know enough inf like about how to make it better. I don't, yeah. So I, this was convenient for me because it's in between my New York and Chicago shows on my tour. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it. And, <laughs> um, and then... So I do want to like redirect all of the attention I can back to organizations like UMA, um, since we like I, I guess I was able to start the conversation or whatever for some people. That's where we sh it should continue in the direction of. But I do think like from within the touring perspective, the one thing I can do is change um, the process of how things work. Since we are my band. Wednesday is doing well right now. Finally, we're, we don't work jobs outside of the band for the first, this year for the first time. Um, I think we should change how we pay opening bands because there's a whole other thing around this that like, um, there's a band, we're not in tour bus at this point, we're still in a van driving ourselves from A to B, but like we've been opening on tour sometimes where the other bands in the tour van, they're staying in hotels every night. We're playing, like we're making, eight to 10 hour drives trying to keep up with them and their sound checks and they've had a full night's rest or whatever and we're spending our, uh, a third of our, what we're getting paid if it's 500 bucks a show or 250 and they're getting thousands of dollars to stay the night wherever we played in a place where we can get some decent sleep. Um, so I think it should be more of a normal thing to maybe like on this tour and some of the ones before it, I've tried to like book hotel rooms in cities where the opening band doesn't know anyone for them. Um, or yeah, just like, I think we should, re like that should culturally be a shift that we shouldn't be paying an opening band 250 a show if you're making six figures, um, et cetera. Like, <laughs> cause yeah, it's, it's honestly like, I don't understand where that logic comes from. Um, especially when they're like, the truth is, yeah, they're just having to work three times as hard to keep up with you in your tour bus or whatever, um, and are so much less comfortable than you. Um, even if like their audience isn't like, doesn't have the same pull or whatever, it's just like kind of inhumane. <laughs> um, and that was the issue a lot of people had with the like romanticization of the tour life thing, like they wanted, like that's, that was a big part of it. Like they're like, why are you staying in these hotel rooms? And I was like, I, I talked to someone at our show last night in New York who was working merch for us because he got fired from his job because he was touring. And he was like, he needed to find a last minute way to make money. And he was like, yeah, I'm about to go on tour and I'm probably gonna be sleeping in like reclining chairs at my friend's house every night. And I was like, that's awful. And they're like, they're also quote unquote doing well. Like it's, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I would say um, man, like being in a band that operates at like a not a you know financially sustainable level like we're we're just a band like we're and we're not trying to be anything more than just people who play music together because we love each other um, and we love playing music together um, there's room for bands like that too um, and uh, I feel like that, like what Carly's saying about you know opening bands like that, like bands like ours, like often don't even get like a chance to get off the ground um, because uh, it's just you know not financially sustainable. And 
part of working a day job is really good um, in that you maintain uh, control <laughs> over your music in a way that you can't necessarily when you are doing it for a full-time job. Um, and I think that that's valuable too. Um, but, uh, you know, I also think that there's no reason that bands like ours should be valued less. Um, and we have to uncouple the idea that making good art um, is drawing a big audience as opposed to like making good art is connecting with people, which is like, I think why we all uh, are up here, right? You know, like we want to make art to connect with people. We want to make music to connect with people. Um, if I, we get to, I mean, we played a show like two, you know, like a day before I got here, I was up till 3 a.m. in the morning, got on a plane. Um, it's part of a queer punk series that is happening at like a really storied uh, gay nightclub in Chicago. Um, it's a really amazing time. Um, they've done like four of these and we were really excited to be on it. Um, we played, you know, in a room to like probably like 60 people and they were, all, but all of those 60 people were fucking stoked yeah. and having the best time. And um, that kind of experience, like people need to be able to take a chance on stuff like that. Um, and not just think about going for the gig that's gonna pay you the most money. Um, you know, how do we make all of this sustainable for bands that are operating at all levels, right? Yeah, can I tap on that real quick? Yeah, of I course. think one thing that happens a lot too, as a venue owner, the venue owner hat, is that we, like as bands, band hat, are like, um, well the venues need to pay us more money. And I, and and. Our venue is like a 200 cap, queer owned, like anarcho run, like venue in Durham. And it's, and I agree, like we need to pay musicians more money, but the venues like on my side and I know on a lot of other people's sides don't make a lot of money on music, which is also right. just shitty. I mean, we just don't. Like we flip shows because music is like my passion and our passion. Like we flip shows to have dance parties or to have karaoke nights, which is not my passion. <laughs> um, so that we can make enough money to be a venue. And I think that that's a thing too, like capitalism pitting people to each other. It's like, ven it's not venues versus artists generally. I mean, it can be, you have plenty of people to be angry at. But um, it's a way of like trying to make the whole system stable, which under capitalism, I don't think you can. But <laughs> in the middle, before the breakdown, like organizing how to, how to, I don't Canada has a bunch of music grants that I know nothing about, but there's not a lot of grant funding for musicians or music, especially that aren't chamber music or that aren't like socially acceptable music, um, at least in North Carolina or in the States. And so I think that the building relationships thing, again, of like venues and venue owners and people who are also like, it might seem like they're part of the system and some of them might be, but are trying to like foster scenes, like just actually having conversations instead of, you know, writing them off, I think is a good idea. Yeah, I can jump back on real quick. Um, I was part of trying to start um, an all ages uh, DIY venue. I had been part of starting one in Baltimore, um, a space called Charm City Art Space, like a long time ago. And um, when I got to Chicago, um, started talking with some friends about um, doing something similar uh, in 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 the city. And we it took us it took us a hot second to like get organized. But when we got organized, we had like a a real solid, like we raised some money, we had like a really solid, like, uh, you know, a bunch of us had worked in the nonprofit industrial complex, so we had uh, some real solid, like, business plans and like how to put things together, and it was gonna be the, a venue that would offer um, arts uh, workshops specifically for, uh, for youth in the city um, in the afternoons, uh, for after school, um, and then shows in the early evening. Um, and we had this like real solid plan and we could not find a place that would rent to us. We looked at hundreds of spaces, hundreds. Um, the real estate market has like a big part to do with this. Mm. And you know, venues obviously like have to stay afloat and have to keep paying their rent too. And the commercial real estate market like does not 
want venues, especially if they are venues with some kind of community yeah. ties. I mean, that's that's true here. It's true that, yes, in Canada, we have more grants comparatively, but like there's also fundamental problems of trying to get those. And for sure, with gentrification in all of our big cities, like we see it here too. Yeah. So many venues that end up having to do that same flip of like karaoke night, dance party, many nights of dance parties, and then like a few shows because they're not making any money. Venues that are getting fined because like fancy condos are like going up around them. And like we don't, there's like rent control sort of things here with residential rent, which you know is a whole nother conversation about problems, but there's nothing with commercial rent. So if you are a venue, or especially if you're like a DIY venue, which like the city used to have a ton of them uh, and still does, but like a lot of them, they have a hard time sustaining because like your landlord could jack up your rent like hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month if you are you know, considered a commercial space and then suddenly you can no longer maintain yourself, right? And like, it's not like there's a lot of community support because suddenly the people around you are like, you know, very rich people moving in and buying these condos and they don't really want there to be a DIY, sp DIY space or like a community space. Um, sort of like a side story, at, like to speak to your sort of like trying to find a space. I used to work at a community center in uh, NDG, which is like a neighborhood more Anglophone to the west of here. Uh, and it was mostly serving like black and brown youth and it was like this really great space. Lots of kids would come through here and the building next to it got accidentally zoned as a residential space. So people Ugh. bought it and became condos. And then those people started complaining about yeah. everything that was going on. So we had to like change the hours of the music program and like change when we could open the windows and this kind of stuff because these people bought it, like regardless of if it was like poorly zoned or whatever, which like accidentally fine, but like you're next to a community center. What did you expect? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, like, all of that market is completely changing how people can survive within the industry. Exact same in Durham. Like, Pinhook has been there for 15, 14, many years. And there was literally nothing. The downtown was deserted. Like, and we came in there, and this is such a classic story or whatever, but now there's, like, a con... They built... It's You're like, what the fuck is that? And there's so... They're, like, million-dollar condos. And the very... I mean, it's like... And I talked to some of these... Some of these richer people come into the pinhook and they're like, hey, I'm gonna have a drink at the bar, you know? But um <laughs> slumming it today. Yeah. <laughs> I really love culture. Um but uh yeah, it's like they do that and then they they the same people that complain, like I see them, I see their Google profile, like I <laughs> know who you are, dude. And it's like why the very reason that you move down somewhere is the and you're pushing it. It's just a story as old as time. And that what makes me so sad is that one thing that makes me sad is that my only solution to the problem besides organizing, but immediacy is a thing with finances too. It's like we have a year and a half until we our lease is up and it was a 10 year lease. And so we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? We don't own the dirt. And my only solution besides community organizing because we've raised like so much money to keep the spot open, but is find a rich white man like that's my <laughs> I'm like what can I do? Oh that's that's the one. Like that's access to money. I don't know how else to do it. So yeah. It's sad, but if anyone has any other ideas, holla. Seems like a legit plan. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the 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 specific um city uh city specific rule that really like screwed us when it came to finding a space um was something that passed city council in the 80s. Um, and uh, commercial real estate uh, in Chicago um, can take empty buildings as tax write-offs. Oh so it is more profitable to them to uh, keep a building empty oh, okay. than it is to take a chance renting to a community space. <laughs> it sucks. Dude, Chicago, yeah. come on. City, sub city subsidize like these million dollar condos that are going in. Right. They subsidize those. Right. They don't subsidize. Yeah. Right. Totally. People who need your money. Yeah. No, it's right. It's like that that story that is this old time of like this is a really cold neighborhood and now everyone has moved there and now and I like I just I don't understand it. It just feels like there's a logic there that is like I don't know. 
there. There's like some sort of block between me and the people that are buying the million dollar condos who like hate all the stuff around it but definitely want to live right around it. Yeah. So, so I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience or I don't know, are there online questions too? No? All right, well, online people, if you want to ask questions, you can. If you're my friend, you can text me and I will ask the questions. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, otherwise, if there's folks in the audience who want to ask any questions, comments. Um, I just get in one thing. Uh, with respect to the lift, it's in the middle of the lift. Right, can you move the microphone a bit? Can you move it higher? Um, can I not? Is that possible? Or is that awesome? It'd be better if, because it's online, so. As far as the grant system in Canada is concerned, Although there is quite a, quite a significant amount of money available, like with everything else, you'd be surprised how much of it goes to people who already have significant resources. Yeah. And so a band like Metric or Feist, say, here, who are playing these huge venues, right? Metric's getting a million dollars a year from the Canadian government, at least. And people, it's a similar thing. There's an underlying uh, thing going along, really, with just about everything that everyone's talking about, which is that everything that's like, I don't understand how this happens. It's that there's a process of the person with the power not acknowledging what's going on because they don't have to. Mm. They're not required to, right? And we live right now in North America in a like colonized land. There's no ethical justification, right? There's no way to talk through that and say, this is why it's okay. The only thing you can do is, well, we just don't acknowledge it. We have to not acknowledge it to some extent. And so like that sort of level of colonial capitalist violence, that's like the, an effective tool of it is is that we're all like, why aren't you acknowledging this? And it's like, well, they don't have to. That's not what's going on. They're not going to. But with the grant system, no one wants to talk about that because we're all relying on the crumbs that we get, right? So as soon as you start going, well, there's something wrong with the grant system here, and then people go, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I need to get my $6,000 that I got last year or whatever, or else I, I start. So no one talk about it. But it's like, there's a guy, uh, Greg Ip, who is a, I think that's his name, but he's, he, he was a label owner in Vancouver who started talking about this, about like the actual specific ways that the grant system's being manipulated by people here. He got pretty much ousted, he moved to LA, it's not in the music industry anymore as far as I know. Um, but yeah, like always uh, for me I think you just always go, right, this rich people and people who are engaged in the active process of any kind of colonial violence rely effectively on not acknowledging what's going on. And I think the best thing you gotta do is like what everyone's basically been saying, but to the furthest degree is you have to just call it out. This is what's happening. You're not allowed to not acknowledge it. That's right. Very true. That's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's also open to comments. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right that the, the scale at which we're going to have to like make them do this stuff is I think just it, it's almost beyond what we can imagine now. Like the American Federation of Musicians was once like a, a once a pretty powerful union in the United States in the early 40s went on a recording strike for uh, two years. Yeah. Um, didn't no one made any records and this was wealthy musicians like Duke Ellington, Gene Krupa, it was like, you know, uh, you know, working class musicians, no one made records for two years. And that's what it took. And that it was like a hundred thousand members more than that at this point. They went on strike for two years and finally won some royalty increases on, you know, physical like vinyl records being sold, which they were still kind of a new technology. And the, the royalty went into a big fund that then funded public uh, performances of music. So it was this way of taking this big surplus being created by the industry and actually channeling it and redistributing it to uh, public performances of music. It was kind of an extraordinary thing that really happened. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think to make it happen, we're going to, yeah, you're, you're right, we need to make them do it. They don't just want to. You're not gonna really sort of morally convince them to do it. They have to be forced to. And it's almost inconceivable how you would do that unless you could get on that scale of being able to like shut shit down with 100,000 people. You have just an enormous amount of work to do to be able to get anywhere near to that point right now. 
I also think that there's a there's an not an issue but like a, an interesting point with an us and them kind of situation, which I know that that is true and in, in, in a big level. But I think power is spread out in so many different levels. Like there are people with utmost power, but I also think that the way that movements are created or like that not memes but like uh, culture the word is escaping but like like the power of everyone has power in a certain extent even in the system not everyone very many people but like as a venue owner I have power as a band with influence you could have power or you know so it's like modeling these practices too I think as people with the power that we do have of like oh yeah I have this power this is my privilege as a white person this is my privilege um, I think on a small scale, I'm not saying like recycling will save the earth, but I think that that is at least something to um, be able to do on a small level. Um, thanks for this panel, by the way. It's been really great and like, it's so refreshing to hear people speak frankly about money in the music industry. Um, I wanted just like a quick comment and then I try to formulate it as a question, but just about like the grant system, I think one thing that I, I try to do as a musician and other musicians I know try to do in Canada is like that kind of skill sharing, but with grants of like trying to, if you get a grant, telling your friends how to write grants, telling the people you know how to write grants. And if they're, if I think if that can be like a bigger movement or a more transparent thing, like that's something that a lot of Canadian musicians could work towards or push towards. Um, my question, I don't know if I'm gonna try to formulate this as, as like a useful, a generative question. Um, I saw recently that Santa Gold canceled her tour for a lot of the same reasons that have been coming up in this panel. And it feels like a moment like when your Twitter thread popped off and now with Santa Gold making this big public statement, it feels like a moment where people are trying to more publicly reckon with the like impossible economics of the industry. And I'm wondering, I guess, how like more musicians can kind of harness this moment and try to come together and say, no, I'm not gonna play that show for $100. Or I, like, I was at South by this year, I found it extremely demoralizing being there, but you feel like you have to do these things for the crumbs that you're gonna get. And I'm, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what to do with this moment where things are starting to be talked about. Yeah, I think, um Ideally, it would be a more casual, like we kind of were saying towards the beginning, to just post. Like, I wish I had started doing it earlier when we were, like, not able to live off of it because, they're, like, literally just, like I was saying, I just posted the numbers and it had a reaction. Like, posting the numbers creates a response. Just, like, you don't even have to say, like, I'm sick and tired of boo 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 of this. I'm, like, I, I, like, you don't have to, like, complain outright. Just, like, put, like, the numbers speak for themselves. I think if we made it more casual to just like post our tour finances, especially if you're like, if you are struggling, those numbers are like hard to argue with. Cause like, that's just how, and like, yeah, if you are like logging, um, like where you stay night to night, like, like I slept on, a hardwood floor on a yoga mat for these two nights. And then I splur we had to splurge on a hotel so we could have a safe drive because we, uh, the next night we had an eight hour drive to so-and-so and we didn't want to do that on floor sleep. Um, just like d describing that experience. Because like, yeah, I don't know if people do know when they see a band at a venue in their town what it took for them to get there. And... Yeah, I think just making that information more like casually available. Um, I think there's a few places that are trying to start archiving. If y'all know about that, like that information specifically. Um, but yeah, I've I posted it for a few tours. But yeah, like I'm saying, like we're finally doing okay, so it doesn't really like our numbers don't really translate how like rough it is like to be honest, because we're doing fine. <laughs> um, but that is so rare <laughs> for bands right now. So I, yeah, I would love to encourage, if y'all are comfortable with it, if any like people in bands are able to, or are seeing this, um, yeah, just make it like a more casual thing to like post your experience. I would love to see that on like all levels of music. Like I want to see folks who are 
you know, doing ridiculously well. You're like Beyonce's and yeah. your Taylor Swift's right. and whatever. Like, I want them also to post it because mm -hmm. it's like, we know you're, you know, you, you are both maybe billionaires. You are very, very wealthy. You're obviously making tons of money. So just say what it is so that everyone up and down, you can see it. Because I also think that like, if people saw that and you could like juxtapose between like, this person is like not even breaking even, but they're touring like, you know, 340 days out of the year. And this person is touring for like 60 days and makes more money than any of us will ever see in our lifetimes. I feel like that would also sort of spur a little bit of a conversation. Also, like, to talk about how not even those billionaires, like, are getting screwed by the music industry, too. Yeah. Like, even at that level. Right? Like, wild. <laughs> even at that level, there's, you know, Taylor Swift re-recording all of her records because she doesn't own, her, like, the masters of those records anymore. Like, that's so wild. Um, and just goes to really, like, speak to how incredibly exploitative the, the industry is at all levels if it, even somebody with that much power and money and visibility um, is like, if you can speak to it again at all levels, just totally wild. Yeah, yeah, it's really bad, right? That if Santa Gold, someone with millions of streams, not sure what, if she's still associated with the label, but you know, at some point has major label or major label adjacent backing, um, can fill up pretty big rooms, can't afford to do it, like who can? Like very few people can do this, um, particularly as you get you know uh, slightly older and have different kinds of expenses, different kinds of a life. Um, it's it's just kind of inconceivable. Um, I think yeah, being public with this information is is fantastic. Can spread the word, can denormalize things, demystify things. I think um, to really build power, there's a step after that. That is yeah, joining an organization. Um, you know. In 2017, I think it was, the South by Southwest stuff, when South by Southwest had a, um, they had a contract clause that said they were going to work with like um, immigration uh, officials in the United States, ICE. Um, and uh, a few musicians started posting on Twitter kind of individual, individually, and that got a lot of press, and that was great, and got the conversation moving. What really got them to change the policy, though, was when a bunch of us, um, like, few thousand musicians, but starting from an email chain with like 20 musicians, 20 bands got together and were like, hey, um, you know, this is great, the Twitter conversation's happening, what can we do to actually like pressure this, this company, South by Southwest, to change this um, and succeed in getting first hundreds and then thousands of musicians, many of who were playing the festival, um, to sign on to a letter that then was urging them to change the policy. Um, and within like two weeks, or maybe not even a week, a week and a half, they caved and changed this contract because they were terrified of the prospect of not just one, but hundreds of musicians who are their festival also just all dropping out, right? One person has no power, but if you have you know, a few hundred musicians who are doing something drop out. South by Southwest is actually a really good target for this because it's one of these rare cases where you have like thousands of musicians who all sign the same contract. It's rare we have that kind of employment relationship as musicians. So it's really ripe for, yeah, I mean, they've been paying artists the same, what was it, is it still like $200? Mm -hmm. You get, yeah, $200 or a wristband. <laughs> you can yeah. choose, yeah, it's absurd. Yeah, and it's been that way for like, what, like 20 years or something? Um, it's, it's, it's absurd and, um, Anyway, if you care about that particular one, you should get involved with, with UMA or whatever organization. You're going to start something different up here in Montreal. But uh, the uh, yeah, going from the step of yeah talking about it, but then building that power so we can do something. Yeah, like the point was made earlier. Like uh, it benefits. It benefits. You know, the the it benefits the people who have control of everything um, to stay silent. Um, and not to organize, um, and they, they are only going to cave if we demand. They're only, and in order to demand, we have to organize. Yeah, like if, if half of South By's festival is on a letter saying, hey, you need to pay us $500 and give us a wristband this next year on an open letter in November, yeah, that's a, that is a battle. I mean, it's one thing, but it's a battle that is a winnable battle 
you know, which is, there's not a lot of window panels in this music industry, but that is one where, you know, that is something you could, you could achieve if people come together to do it. Yeah. It does also prove the point that none of the music industry exists without musicians, right? We're this weird, like, switch around where it's like, we actually have the product that they need and want to survive, so, you know, they should remember that and we should also remember that. Um, all right, well, we're gonna leave it on that. Thank you so much to all of you. This was a really fun conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience and to Pop and to Eve as always. Um, yeah, f thank you. And if anybody's got more questions, whatever, write them in a chat box somewhere. There's probably a chat box. You can, you know, text me angry notes if you didn't like it. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>